Hello everyone. Here we're going to be talking about the slope of the isoprofit curve. In so doing, we're going to be talking about the objectives of firms and what constrains firms in being able to maximize their profits. So thinking about that, thinking about this pro process of profit maximization, we're going to return to this concept of constrained maximization that we've used previously. So there are two elements, and the first one is the objectives of the owners of the firm. So the objectives of the decision maker are represented by isoprofit curves. These are similar to indifference curves like we saw previously in different chapters in the book. But for an isoprofit curve, we're thinking about um, combinations of quantity and price that result in the same level of profit or a given level of profit. Now remember here that iso means equal or fixed. So isoprofit means equal profit. Now, um, that's what the um, objectives of the owners of the firm are. The, firm, the owners of the firm want to find ways to increase or maybe maximize their profits. Now, we also want to think about this in terms of the constraints on the owners of the firm. They can't just basically like choose an incredibly high price and sell a huge amount of output. They have to think about both of these things together. They have to think about what price and what quantity are feasible for them. So... The decision maker's feasible set of choices are all of the price quantity combinations that the firm could actually implement given the demand curve for the product. So the thing that constrains the firm is the demand curve. Then that demand curve is determined by the preferences of us as consumers. Right? So the owners of the firm are limited by the demand which is determined by our preferences. Okay, so we're going to start with the isoprofit curves here. So the labels on the right of each isoprofit curve tell us the level of profits they are associated with. So pi 3 is greater than pi 2 is greater than pi 1 is greater than pi 0, and pi 0 has 0 profits. So pi here represents profits. That's something that we have done before, and you'll see when we talk about the profit function that um, these profits are going to be represented by the Greek letter pi. Now, if we're comparing points along a given isoprofit curve, um, at point A over here, um, we have a combination of price and quantity of PA and XA, and um, that price and quantity combination results in the same profits as point B with um, price PB and quantity XB. So you can see we can find these by looking at the different points on the axes that correspond to the points that we're interested in, so A and B. So what do we notice when we contrast points A and B? If we contrast points A and B, we can see that at point A, the firm is charging a high price but producing a low quantity. At point B, it's charging a lower price and producing a large quantity. Both of those points are resulting in the same amount of profit. Okay, so in terms of the firm's revenues minus its costs, they're resulting in the same profit. Now, um, if the price equals the average cost, there'll be no profits no matter how many units are sold. So both points E and D are um, on the isoprofit curve where um, the price is equal to the average costs, and therefore the firm makes zero profits. Okay, so that's just an initial idea in terms of thinking about the combinations of prices and quantities that result in the same profits for the firm. Okay, so now we know that with the isoprofit curves, we're showing the combination of prices and quantities sold of a good yielding equal or ISO profits to the owners of the firm. Now, the firm owner is therefore indifferent between making a given level of profit by selling a lot at a low price or selling a little at a high price. So what does that mean? If we're considering points B and A, um, the owners of the firm are indifferent between choosing points A or B because they yield the same level of profit. The thing that is eventually going to, de to determine which of those points get chosen is what the demand curve is from us as the consumers in this market. Okay, so here's the thing. The negative of the slope of the isoprofit curve is the marginal rate of substitution between selling more output at lower prices and selling less output at higher prices. So remember what's happening here as we're moving between points A and B um, along the given isoprofit curve pi 2. What are we seeing there? As we move along the um, in difference, uh, along the um, isoprofit curve, what is happening? Um, up at point A, we're selling a lot 
um, we're selling a low quantity at a high price. At point B, we're selling a high quantity at a low price. Moving along that curve, we want to think about the slope of the isoprofit curve. And the negative of the slope of the isoprofit curve is going to be the marginal rate of substitution. So here, when we're thinking about that, the firm will be trading off selling goods at a higher price and selling goods at a lower price. When it sells goods at a lower price, it sells a greater quantity. When it sells goods at a higher price, it sells a lower quantity. Okay, so um, let's think about that a little bit more. Now, at point A, the owner is willing to decrease the price significantly to sell an additional unit. Why? If we think about the slope of the isoprofit curve here, and the marginal rate of substitution is, as usual, defined as the negative of that slope, they are willing to pay a significant price in order to um, basically sell more units of the good. So they're willing to decrease the price in order to sell more units of the good while keeping the profit constant. At point B, what do we see? The opposite is true. They're not willing to decrease the price substantially to sell an additional unit. Um, on the contrary, they will only decrease the price by a little bit in order to sell more output. That's because the slope is flat at point B, therefore the marginal rate of substitution is low, therefore the firm is not willing to um, decrease the price substantially in order to sell an additional unit of the good. Now, what about the isoprofit curve that coincides with the um, um, average cost curve? Now, what that is doing is it tells us that when the price is equal to average cost, profits are zero, so selling a little or a lot yields the same amount of profit for the firm. Therefore, at that price, the willingness to pay to sell more is just simply zero. Okay, so the firm is indifferent between points E and D along its average cost curve, but its willingness to pay to sell more goods is zero. It's not willing to pay any more to sell more units of the, of the, of the good. Okay. So the question is, how do we actually find the marginal rate of substitution? I've already said that it's the negative of the slope of the um, isoprofit curve. But now what we want to do is we want to derive that from our first principles, from thinking about what the equation is for the um, profit for the firm. So we're going to start with the equation for profit. Now, just as a reminder, we take the firm's revenues and we substitute from the firm's revenues its costs. Now, its revenues are the price that it sells the good at multiplied by the quantity of the good that it sells. And then its costs are the um, unit costs of the good multiplied by its output. We can take x out as a common factor, the output, and then we can see that it's the output multiplied by the difference between the price minus the unit costs. Okay. Now, like with indifference curves, we know that along an isoprofit curve, profit is constant. So what that means is that along an isoprofit curve, d, delta, um, d pi is equal to zero. So d pi along an isoprofit curve is zero. Remember that d pi is the change in profit along an isoprofit curve. Because profit doesn't change, there is no change in profit along an isoprofit curve. Therefore, the change in profit is zero. So when we take the total derivative of our um, isoprofit curve, we're going to be able to find an equation for the negative of the slope and find the marginal rate of substitution. So using the total derivative, we'll see that d pi is equal to the partial derivative of the profit function with respect to x multiplied by the change in x plus the partial derivative of profit with respect to the chain, uh, with respect to price multiplied by the change in price. Okay, so we've got two components here. The first one is to do with output and the second one is to do with price. Now remember, we said that d pi is equal to zero. Hence, this whole thing is equal to zero like we have it over here. Now, what we can do is we can rearrange this um, with the, um, the partial derivative of pi with respect to p multiplied by dp. We can take that to the other side. And so that's what we do over here. So I'm just going to erase some of the notes so you can see that more clearly. So what can we see here? We've taken the one term and moved it to the other side. So we've taken this term here, the partial derivative of, p with, um, of pi with respect to p multiplied by the change in p, and it is now on the other side of the equation. Therefore, we've subtracted it from both sides. So what is that going to leave us with? Well, now we can divide both sides through by the partial derivative of profit with respect to p, and then we can take the um, dx of both sides. Now, what is that going to leave us with? That's going to leave us with dp dx um, with a negative in front of it. it. So 
the negative of the slope of the isoprofit curve minus dp dx is equal to the ratio of the two partial derivatives, um, partial pi, partial x, um, divided by partial pi, partial p. Okay, so these are the two partial derivatives. And remember that with our notation, we say that's equal to pi subscript x divided by pi subscript p. And that is the marginal rate of substitution um, with respect to x and p. Okay, so what are we thinking about here? What we're thinking about is that we have a trade-off that the firm is willing to make. And the trade-off that the firm is willing to make, um, what do we think about that? It's about the change in its profit as it changes its output, um, given um, or divided by the change in its profit with respect to what happens when it changes its price. That's the trade-off that the firm is considering making with respect to its marginal rate of substitution in terms of lowering its price in order to increase its um, output by one unit. So just to think through a little bit more of this, we know the equation for the marginal rate of substitution, as we've just said, it's pi x divided by pi p. Um, and we remember now that the um, uh, the equation for profit is px minus cx. So if we had to find this partial derivative pi subscript x, um, what is that? We partially differentiate this function with respect to x, and we see that pi x is equal to p minus c. And then what is pi p? Pi p is equal to the partial derivative of the same function with respect to p, and that's equal to x. Therefore, what's our marginal rate of substitution, our MRS, equal to pi p, I'm sorry, pi x divided by pi p is equal to p minus c all over x. So that is our marginal rate of substitution. And so we're thinking here um, about the, um, the ratio of these two partial derivatives um, in terms of like the marginal benefit of changing quantity versus the marginal benefit of changing price. And that's what we're seeing here. So it's the trade-off that the firm is willing to make in terms of the benefits it will receive from increasing output by one unit and decreasing price by some amount in order to increase output by that amount. Now, what we're going to see in the next video in a, and also in the kind of next part of the book is how we take this marginal rate of substitution as the negative of the slope of the isoprofit curve and set it equal to the marginal rate of transformation or the slope of the constraint, right? So what we have there is the MRS equal to MRT in order to find the profit maximum for the firm. And we'll do that soon.